I do remember being at some kind of picnic or outing. There were a bunch of kids there, a bunch of homeschool families. It was in a beautiful backyard and um, in the summer, and there was a big slide there, and a bunch of kids were in line going up the, to go down the slide. And, um, and when I finally got up to the top, we were waiting for the kids in front of us to go down the slide, and I looked up and I realized the man standing in front of me was not a kid, it was a man waiting to go down the slide. And I looked up and he looked down at me and he had this kind of canvas hat on and, and red shorts, that's my memory. And after I went down the slide, I went over to my mother and I said, who's that weird guy <laughs> going down the slide with the kids? And she said, that's John Holt. Welcome to the new millennium. It's just as we predicted. Picture phones, space stations, moon bases, flying cars, warp drive. But I don't have to know an answer. I don't have to, I don't feel frightened by not knowing things. By being lost in the mysterious universe without having any purpose, which is the way it really is as far as I can tell possibly. It doesn't frighten me. Welcome to Unschooling Future, where children are people. Okay, we checked all four systems, and there you go on modulation, all four, and keying was a go. Five, four, three, two, one. Hi, I'm Sofia Korninko, and you're listening to the Unschooling Future podcast. This season is devoted to kids and teens' digital rights and access to information. Because I'm writing and illustrating what will be partially a comic book about kids and teens' freedom to self-direct their online learning. The book will be called Free to Browse. When we talk about self-directed learning, we always talk about it in terms of educational experiences, how life learning can be very educationally enriching, how it prepares kids for the future. Is that really what's most important about self-directed education? And why do we feel the need to try to sell young people's formative experiences as academic or educational? Ben Draper, a former MIT fellow and founder and executive director of the Maycomber Center in Framingham, Massachusetts, that's a self-directed learning community for ages 5 to 18, believes that children who grow up with their basic needs met will have the tools they need when they get older to figure out how to continue to create the kind of life they want to live. In this episode, Ben and I try to come to the core of how self-directed learning unfolds today and the role digital technology plays in this delicate process. How did you uh, find such a beautiful building? For those who haven't been to the center, I should probably describe that it's very picturesque, almost fairy tale like at least for me as a very urban person. <laughs> and the snowflakes are falling slowly behind huge windows and there's a huge outdoor area. How did you find such a beautiful location? Well, when we were getting ready to put this together, um, Denise actually, who's the co-director here, had heard of a Sudbury school, I think, where the founders um, went around to summer camps because summer camps obviously don't do much in the winter. And so sometimes they're, those beautiful big spaces are available throughout the winter for rent. So uh, once we decided to try that strategy, we happened to find this place, which was right where we wanted to do it in Framingham. It's not, it's not really like a summer camp sort of cabin it's actually more like a big conference center really nice building and um, tons of outdoor space and they had never even been approached with you know such a proposition so they said sure why not and um, gave us a really reasonable uh, lease because they weren't really making money from it otherwise during the winter so that's what yeah we were really lucky and we've been here ever since for 11 years now. And how many children do you have now? Uh, over 60 kids. We, on any given year, we usually are somewhere between 60 and 70 these days. Maybe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I get the impression that Framingham is, uh, at least on the East Coast, is sort of like one of the hubs for unschooling and self-directed learning. There's so much here that revolves around this. 
topic or or yeah am i right uh, that's my impression but you know <laughs> um john holt um the sort of father of unschooling he coined that term was from this area his office was in cambridge i think um growing without schooling and um Sudbury Valley, of course, was founded in 1968 in Framingham. It's still running, still going strong. Peter Gray lives in this area. He's a very prominent voice in both the unschooling world and democratic education world. And um, actually, I keep hearing, I feel like every day I hear of a new self-directed learning center opening up in one of the surrounding towns. A lot of people um maybe especially since the pandemic the idea has really caught on um yeah so it certainly seems that way to me but is there anything special around i don't know massachusetts or greater boston do, do you think people are looking for alternative ways alternatives to public school or is it just because it started here with the first sudbury valley school why why is there such acceptance in this particular area. I know that such micro schools are popping up all over the United States at the moment, so it's not special to this area, but in general, yeah. like originally there's more of it here than in other places. I would only be speculating, but um, I think that a lot of people are in need of a place like this, but they don't know it. They don't know that such a thing exists. Yeah, they don't. They really just don't know that such a thing exists, and so I think a lot, a, a big part of it is just the kind of um, publicity, you know. And once people become familiar with the idea, you see more and more people turning to it. So in a place where no one's ever heard of it, no one's ever done it, it's kind of unlikely that it would just spontaneously occur to somebody to create a place like this. So I think there is kind of a momentum, you know that probably started with Sudbury Valley. Um, but, you know, this is my impression. It's totally speculation. <laughs> I think uh, I read in uh, Carrie McDonald's book that you have some memories of actually seeing John Holt as a kid, that your mom brought you to his office. Can you, can you, <laughs> yeah, I guess can you say how, a few words about that? I guess this is how legends are created. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I was so young. My... I do remember being at some kind of picnic or outing. There were a bunch of kids there, a bunch of homeschool families. It was in a beautiful backyard and um, in the summer, and there was a big slide there, and a bunch of kids were in line going up the, to go down the slide. And, um, and when I finally got up to the top, we were waiting for the kids in front of us to go down the slide. And I looked up and I realized the man standing in front of me was not a kid. It was a man waiting to go down the slide. And I looked up and he looked down at me and he had this kind of canvas hat on and, and red shorts. That's my memory. And after I went down the slide, I went over to my mother and I said, who's that weird guy <laughs> going down the slide with the kids? And she said, that's John Holt. Um, and so that's when the name first kind of stuck in my mind. And I think I also was at the his office a couple times because my mother would drive to Cambridge to kind of consult with him. She was, you know, trying to unschool her kids in community, which had never heard of unschooling, thought she was crazy, sort of including my father. So she needed some sense of support and, you know, camaraderie. So she would just physically drive in, you know, to see John Holt. And th that was in the days when you could do such a thing. I mean, We'd all be very lucky to have John Holt sort of cheerleading for us personally um, when we make this radical move. But uh, that was the conditions in those days. Did he manage to convince your father? Uh, no. My father was never entirely convinced. But at least to his credit, he didn't um, create any major obstacles, you know, for my mother and I. Again, uh, from what I've read, I know that you were only unschooled at home and until a certain age something like eight right and then you found the Sudbury Valley School yeah was that because your father believed that that would be 
more of like a conventional <laughs> solution that you still went to some sort of school, at least for the outsiders? No, I don't think my father <laughs> thought Sudbury Valley was any more conventional than our, you know, living room. It was really my mother's idea, I think. Um, she had come across Sudbury Valley maybe in a Growing Without Schooling journal or something and um, sort of put it in the back of her head. She was happy with the idea of unschooling, especially when there were a lot of kids in our neighborhood. So she had managed to convince a bunch of her friends to try this radical approach and um, kind of get on board with the unschooling thing. And so I had some friends to play with. And then there were kids in the neighborhood of also. But as they got older and um, spent more time in school and slowly the other unschooling kids, you know, their parents started thinking it was just too outside of the box, I think, as their kids got older. So pretty soon I just ran out of kids to play with. And um, that's, I think, when my mom started to think maybe we should check out Sudbury Valley. And I was seven or eight when we started going there. She drove me from Newburyport, Massachusetts, which is way up on the North Shore. And it was about an hour and a half drive each way. So she would drive to Sudbury Valley. I would be at school all day. She would spend the day in the bookstore in Framingham. That was in the days when um, Barnes and or Borders Bookstore had just arrived in Framingham. And it was like nobody had ever seen such a castle of a bookstore and um, with a coffee shop. So she was kind of in heaven. She could stay there all day. We, we should appreciate it because like people now we would say, okay, I'm just going to wait for my kid at the cafe and like there's free Wi-Fi and I can work. But right. <laughs> your mom didn't have a laptop. No. All she had was those books. Yeah. And co plenty of coffee, I guess. Yeah. It, it, it was quite a sacrifice and I'm very grateful for that. And did you have any siblings? Yeah, I have an older brother and an older sister and it never really caught on for them. Uh, my brother went to Sudbury Valley for a year or two, but he was older and he was kind of almost ready to be done with school anyway. And my sister was never interested. She had friends in public school and was happy there. And, and now, if I may ask, they, uh, their kids also go to conventional school of your siblings? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the only one who inherited the radical alternative education gene from my mother. <laughs> because now, of course, times are different and it's not that radical anymore. I was just wondering whether right. it spread in the family. But you're saying no. Not really, no. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> do you have like any discussions about it or is it a topic that better left untouched better left untouched yeah they it's still they, very 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 touchy feely right for many yeah, people yeah they think it's great um for me but they would never in a million years do that for their kids the reason being are they saying uh, you know i don't know i mean it's just like to some people this is just some bizarre like why would you why would you do that you know, my kid's, my kid's doing fine in school, you know, even if, I don't know. It just doesn't occur to them. They're almost blind to it, you know. And, and their kids never said they were jealous of, of your kids? No, because it's like, it, it's just not an option. Because I've noticed that, well, we don't have that many friends here yet because we only very recently moved from Europe, but mm -hmm. back in uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, I noticed among my friends that they felt uneasy every time our kids talked about how they don't have to go to school and they were afraid their kids wouldn't want to go to school because they thought it wasn't allowed and now yeah. we had that option so they were so trying like it, to cut it, it those could, conversations short it could be like a contagious disease or <laughs> yeah yeah I, i'm aware of that dynamic certainly and i remember it as a kid i remember there always being a little bit of strangeness like between me and other kids you know like my neighbors in my neighborhood you know what do you mean you you don't have grades well how do you learn anything you don't go to class how do you learn anything aren't you afraid you're gonna you know just be a loser all your life <laughs> um 
Yeah, but you know, it's something you learn. I think it's something you learn to deal with pretty early on. I know, I know a lot of kids here who, who deal with that too. Kids they know. Oh, really? At the moment, still? Because yeah. as far what like what I'm normally now when I tell people about what we're doing or, or my kids are telling other kids, the the reaction is very normal. Like they they know what homeschooling is and. Nobody is shocked. Everybody's very, so far, has been very yeah. <laughs> accepting of that here, I mean, as I think, opposed to Europe. Yeah, I think homeschooling has become pretty respectable, and some people even see it as this kind of elevated thing. You know, you get a super excellent education because you your parents are totally like your personal hands-on tutors. and But... This kind, you know, if a kid says, oh, well, where do you go to school? And and one of these kids says, well, I go to this place called the Maycumber Center where we, you know, just play all day. Um, I think a lot of these, well, some of these kids might just say I'm a homeschooler and leave it at that. But kids who really see this as their educational environment describe themselves as Maycumber Center students and they say I go to the Maycomber Center well what's that and they explain it and it just sounds like this crazy it's a private school <laughs> yeah you, you could spin it all kinds of different ways but if you really want to be honest you know it's gonna sound a little crazy well first of all let's go back to the time when you went to college how did you get in and what was the reaction of people there to to your past to your background at the college yeah did they find it weird I'm sure they did, you know, if and when I have the occasion to talk about it, but I, I don't think I talked about it much. I mean, the... Well, they accepted you. They accepted me, yeah. Um, so the way that I got into Tufts was I, I hadn't done my SATs. I didn't have a high school transcript. I had a piece of paper that said Sudbury Valley School on it, but nobody knew what to make of that. I mean, what are you handing me this for? I thought, well, it's, what do you mean? It's my high school diploma. And they said, it doesn't look like any high school diploma I've ever seen. So I had to kind of, you know, talk my way in. And most kids in my position, I think most kids I grew up with at Sudbury Valley had done their SATs. You take your SATs and that's your kind of magic key. Uh, I didn't do that because I kind of didn't know I wanted to go to college until all of a sudden one day when I was 20 or 21, I decided that's where I needed to be. So I just went straight there. I just physically walked in and I said, I want to go here. And they said, they kind of scratched their head and said, whoa, like how, how would that work? And, you know, cause I didn't have anything to show them. And we talked, I don't really remember it that clearly, but we talked for half an hour and finally she said, well, let me talk to some people and see what I can do. So then a couple days later, she called me and she said, okay, here's what we can do. We'll let you enroll, whatever, uh, if you take a writing 101 class at like a local community college first and get an A. If you can get an A, because I wanted to do art, history, and philosophy. So that would require a lot of reading and writing. So they said, if you can get an A in a writing 101, then we'll let you come for a year on the condition that you keep up a high grade point average. So I did, and I did, and that was it. Did you like it? Yeah, I loved it. Coming from Sudbury Valley, you know, where you have to spend the whole day trying to figure out what to do with yourself. And... Um, you, you dream of these places where people just kind of feed you knowledge and, you know, I mean, that's not necessarily how you want to spend your life as a child. But on the other hand, it has this kind of appeal to it, you know, when you've never had that. And so the idea that I could just go in there like it's a restaurant and you open the menu and look at all this amazing stuff and all you have to do is show up in this room at this time and they're going to just spew amazing knowledge at you about a topic you're really interested in and that's like a that's a dream it's like the internet yeah exactly <laughs> before the a little bit well the internet was around but i certainly wasn't using it 
And now, if we jump to now, and people who leave Maycomber uh, Center, they some of them, I guess, go to college, some don't. What's like the general overview? Can you give me an overview of how people continue their life's journeys? Um, it's so varied. And we don't really, I mean, we sort of informally stay in touch with people just personally. And we hear, you know, so-and-so's just completed this college program or they're working on a farm in upstate New York or whatever, but we don't really, we, we've never done any like study of our graduates or anything like that. But, you know, I, I don't think, I've never heard of anyone encountering real obstacles. Well, because I know colleges have gotten used to homeschoolers and unschoolers for sure. It's no longer mm -hmm. this weird thing. And Right. Yeah, they're sort of looking for unusual, exceptionally motivated kids and kids who are creative and have a strong sense of who they are and what they want to do. I'm asking this also partly because like what I um, observe in my own kids who are now entering their like teen teenage years um, because they're not going to any sort of center or school. We don't also, we don't really see that end point. You know, like they're already now living the lives that they will be when they're grown ups, except for now they're still not exactly sure what will be their main thing and what they will be using to make a living. But for the rest, my day is not very different from theirs. They're just working on their projects, mm -hmm. whatever they're interested in or studying something, or my son is a programmer. So, and they're very, both very introverted. So we're sort of like, you know, working alongside each other right. <laughs> from home, right. <laughs> remote work. I, I think this is the way it will look yeah. for them also 10 years down the road. Yeah. And I don't really see that end point of like graduation or now you're right. done. Right. <laughs> I don't think that exists. Right. But I guess if you are um, attending some sort of center, then that point does exist on the timeline. And I wonder how people are perceiving that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we've talked about having some kind of um, moving on process. We wouldn't offer a diploma or anything because we're not a school. But um, I think it is nice for kids to kind of mark the end of their time here. That was really important for me growing up at Sudbury Valley. It was really important to have that graduation ceremony. But yeah, I think by the time kids reach that age, you know, they're already, they've already kind of, we have kids here who have already started taking college courses here and there, or they're working part time. And they try to keep one foot in the Maycumber Center community for as long as possible because they're, they have a lot of attachments, social attachments. But by that time, you know, they're kind of ready to do something else and, um, and they move pretty seamlessly into college and work. And I see, well, today's not a nice day outside, even though it's beautiful when you're inside to watch the snowfall. Mm. <laughs> but I see everybody's like, very cozily jammed in the in the living room or whatever you call yeah. it, the main room mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> at the May Commerce Center. And most people are um, doing something online. Mm -hmm. How much is um, that part of, a, of the daily routine? Like, because from my experience, again, like online is the main source of basically any best teachers, best knowledge. Yeah. And I guess... Yeah, any young person now feels that. At the same time, you could then wonder why come here, right? You you can do that from home as well. I, I'm sure they're yeah. like really have strong ties here yeah. amongst each other. So is it more interesting to you know be online together, <laughs> or even though everybody has their own computer, I see. Yeah, and you're exposed to so many different. Um, you're exposed to a lot of different stuff. Um, when you're sitting next to somebody or when somebody's walking through the room talking about something else. Um, there's, I mean, just within, you know, the huge world of video games, there's kids who sit together and help each other. I almost never see two kids sitting next to each other playing video games, not talking. That doesn't really happen. They're always talking. They're always asking and answering each other's questions and sometimes pontificating for, you know, a long time period of time about everything they know about this video game and what they've done and what they're doing and you so so there's a lot of collaboration and creativity and um teaching and learning and then the you know bonds the 
social bonds are very important. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff online. They check my email. I have to, you know, I sometimes write. Um, I research stuff online, but I'm sort of an extrovert. And I'd much rather do that in a place with other people around. I had a very sh short stint at the MIT Media Lab um, as a um, director's fellow. And that was the whole idea there. The, the architecture was created to really kind of ensure um, cross-pollination and collaboration and creativity. And, uh, you know, I remember this, they had this really wide staircase so that when you're walking up, you co constantly kind of bumping into people and having conversations on the stairway. That sort of, you know, I think they were just trying to replicate kind of what happens in a natural environment like this, where you have people who come together and form um, relationships uh, based on mutual interests and um, you come into contact with people with very different interests and things you'd never think of doing and um, the sorts of things kids do online I mean it's just kind of endlessly fascinating how many different things kids are doing that I, I have absolutely you know like I've never seen before you know if you you can look at a room full of kids on their screens and say, oh, oh my God, these kids are rotting their brains. <laughs> but if you go look what they're actually doing and talk to them about it, it's like a whole world of amazing stuff. They're reading, they're creating art, they're communicating with people halfway across the world. Yeah, so I think it's really important to have this space. I mean, not to mention the fact that Digital technology is not the only thing that happens here. It's actually, you know, a, a small slice of what happens here. Um, on a day like this, you do see a lot of kids using screens or, you know, iPads or computers. But what are kids who come here like? Are most of them more like extroverted? Do they want to see other kids every day? Or do you have people who would prefer to, to be on their laptop the whole day, even if it's a nice day outside? Well, you have introverts and extroverts, I guess, anywhere you go, but it, it, do, it, it doesn't necessarily break down that way. Like introverts like to be on their screens and extroverts like to be outside running around with other kids. Um, sometimes introverts will be lying in the grass outside, you know, and, uh, or reading a book or, you know, playing guitar. Um, and extroverts will have their headphones on with their friends playing, you know, uh, collaborative video games. It's definitely a, an environment which provides the conditions for kids who like to be alone or, you know, just kind of have one buddy that they hang out with or, you know, people who like to be in big groups of people and do big group activities, you know, huge games of capture the flag or whatever. So it's pretty flexible in that way. Is it the parents' decision to bring their kids here or... Is it sometimes also that kids have heard of something like this and they want they would prefer to be here rather than at home or rather than at school? How does it all start? I think it's usually the parents. I don't think kids very often find out about a place like this if their parents don't want them to. <laughs> Unless they're teenagers and have read like the Teenage Liberation Handbook or something <laughs> like that or gotten radicalized <laughs> online, you know, and then they find this. But in fact, some parents will say, uh, I, you know, I'd like to come visit your center next Monday at 2 o'clock. Um, my husband and I would like to come by and see it. I don't think we'll bring our son because um, we're not ready for him to see it, you know, because he might fall in love with it, and we don't know if we're ready to go there, you know. <laughs> yeah, they don't want the kids to fall in love with the place, you know, until they're sure they're ready to take the leap, you know, because it's, it's a leap. It's a real leap of faith, sort of. So they don't bring the kid on the first visit. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I, I guess I understand that because, you know, kids do really love this place when they come often, very often. How could you not want to be here? <laughs> That's the way I felt when I, when my parents first brought me to Sudbury Valley when I was seven or eight, I was really attached to my mother. I didn't like to go over friends' houses. I had never gone on a sleepover. Um, I mostly like to have my friends come to my house. And um, somehow when I first set foot on that campus, I just felt like I was home. And it was so enormous and wondrous. And, you know, there was so much to explore. And 
felt so safe and um, comfortable. And um, that's really, I mean, these places are just so precious. That's really what inspired us to create this place. So what was your, your biggest revelations over the past 10 years? What have you discovered about how kids learn? Or I think what I've realized over the past 10 years about how kids learn is um, that, you know, in the world of self-directed education, so-called, that's what we're calling it these days, um, when proponents of this approach talk about it, they always talk in terms of learning educational experiences and how even the most kind of seemingly mundane activities can be educationally enriching and so forth. I think that what kids need is um, all children, just like all adults, have the need to be happy, to um, be, you know, free from coercion and to be allowed to pursue the things that interest them and that are enjoyable. Um, and I don't know if we need to try to sell these experiences as educational. I think that uh, children who grow up with their basic needs being met will have the tools they need when they get older to figure out how to continue to create the kind of life that they want to live. And um, we don't need to make sure that we're preparing them all the time. Because we also have no idea, right? what we're supposed to prepare them for. Right. A friend of mine said to me yesterday, I was talking to her on the phone, she's from Florida, and she said, you know, parents are under so much pressure these days, and yet we don't really know what the pressure is. Like, it's hard to tell what we're supposed to be doing. We just know that we're supposed to be doing something really well and not screwing it up. There's so much pressure to raise our kids and to make sure they're ready, but like we don't really know what we're supposed to be doing. And that pressure is really debilitating for parents and for children. Children feel it. The worst part of parenting for me in Europe was that I was supposed to somehow report in this way or another to the government authorities because it's as if they have to control whether we're meeting certain ends in terms of education I mean and I had I would have to translate everything the wonderful things that happened in our household into education ease <laughs> right <laughs> and some yeah. and somehow you know attach if it weren't numbers some way of what is the way you evaluate the progress mm, right and unfortunately there's still such a demand here mm. even though to a much lesser degree because uh, in Belgium, where we used to live, the, like the compulsory home inspections and exams. Mm. But even here in the United States, where we feel much freer, I'm still supposed to like submit a letter of intent and a plan, what we're supposed to do, and then mm. like a progress report or whatever. So I still feel like I, I have to, and I guess you probably have to do the same, or the parents of the kids that are attending May Comber Center have to do the same in terms of like submitting something to the Massachusetts uh, public schools districts, like, yeah. you know, because the Massachusetts law that you have to like once a year submit some kind of progress report. And so you have to s still somehow translate that, which you're talking about in, into this educational language. Are you preparing your kids for something? So this, this is the part that I really hate that it still exists, that, mm. that there's this accountability in the wrong way not accountability for relationship and mental right. health. Right, And just, you know, creating an environment where you're empowered, but accountability mm -hmm. for evaluation and control. Right. They don't say, they don't say, is your child living a life that he finds meaningful and fulfilling? Because then you could say, yes, I can attest to that. <laughs> but they want to know, you know, that he's meeting certain benchmarks or something. But they don't actually... Ask, what I say is um, in every subject, you know, I have it broken down by subject, English, math, science, and I say my child is progressing in these areas. I, I mean, it's really that vague. I've never said anything more specific than that. And, and then it says, how are you assessing this? And I say through informal observation, which means I know him. Like I, I see him on a regular basis. 
which is the edu- uh, education he's for. I know him and I trust him. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a vague sense of like that he's thriving and that his model of the world is becoming larger and more sophisticated. If that wasn't the case, that there would be a problem, but I know that that's the case. And I don't ask him what math he knows or what he knows about biology. And sometimes he just spontaneously starts talking about it. Um, but I just trust that he's growing like we all are. You know, most school districts, most of the time, if you report that kind of thing to the superintendent, they just, they'll accept that. And how has the accessibility of information and of knowledge changed over the past 10 years at least that, that you've been observing this firsthand in so many children? How has that changed the whole learning pattern or daily routine? You mean digital like, technology? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's becoming more and more ubiquitous. And yeah. I, like you, you, you had to have bring your kids to places to expose them to certain topics and now... You wouldn't even, like you've mentioned this already, you wouldn't even think of the things that exist out there and that they find themselves. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, I mean, they can find all kinds of amazing stuff online. And if you're, if they're interested in something, they, they research it and and it's extremely easy to do and fast, but it's always kind of been that way. I mean, I remember kids when I was a kid, I remember my friends talking about, you know, whatever, like stuff that I knew nothing about. And I don't know where they got it. They, you know, maybe from books, maybe from quizzing their parents about it. You know, sometimes, sometimes you can get a lot of information from adults who are interested in the stuff that you're interested in and from other kids. I mean, kids have a way of finding the information that's going to be um, relevant to them. I think a, there's, a t- there's a lot more information out there more accessible anyway but yeah kids have always been able to figure out how to get the information they need somehow so basically this is what i like the picture i see out there in the in the room where all the kids are sitting (laughs) at their screens it's like it's just an organic part of their daily life it's not like it's something very different to anything else they do right yeah hopefully these kids don't have some kind of neurotic relationship with a digital technology, you know, where they feel like they're restricted, they have to get it all in in three hours, or like they have some kind of guilty conflict. You know, sometimes we see kids who whose parents are kind of down on them about you so much so-called screen time, and so they'll try to like be on screens less, but then they sort of try to sort of guilt and shame their friends who are who they feel like are on it too much because it's kind of a jealousy dynamic like what are you doing like aren't you afraid you're going to become a screen zombie you're you know but if kids are really trusted and allowed to be allowed to follow their own interests and curiosity they have a very healthy relationship with technology generally yeah this is this is the way what my experience has been it's the same as anything really when you know when something's a forbidden fruit right then you see a lot of sneakiness right and right. if it, if you just talk about what what the dangers are there and and they experience uh, every day how to deal with anything coming up, it's just like going out in the street and dealing with traffic. Right. But do you, as a center, um, are there any rules for for you as a center for children to like impose any restrictions in terms of like censoring content? We've just been through this big, long process um, in the past few weeks. Of we, Some of the kids created a video game uh, rating system because a lot of video games now are unrated. And we have to figure out what's appropriate for a public setting because we have five-year-olds looking over the shoulders of, you know, 16-year-olds. But it always comes down to... I mean, we've never kind of... We've never, uh, you know created like, um, what are they called? When you put like safeguards on the Wi-Fi or something so the kids can't access certain things. We've never done that. It's uh, It's just amazing, isn't it? How much of like technology has popped up recently to control children, to control their access to information. And I personally think that that's like really violating their human rights and people don't seem to see that. Yeah. So you weren't, you weren't. Well, people don't worry about human rights when it comes to children. (laughs) 
<laughs> they're not human in that way. Not quite human yet. But you weren't obliged to install anything like that by any any law, right? There is nothing no. that obliges you as a center no. for children, or I don't know if there's any legislation. Right. I mean, obviously, no one wants. You know, the parents here don't want their kids like watching porn. Uh, but that would be completely <laughs> inappropriate for a public. I mean, it would be like going into a library. You don't. Yeah. You know, kids have a sense of what's okay to do here and what's not and they trust us yeah but what i mean them. is like you have like schools where children literally can't access many websites that are completely innocent oh right just because of so many blocks right. and and all those censorship censorship systems installed right a much more sen yeah that's that seems really weird to me i mean a much more sensible approach would be to have a conversation with a child you know about it and make sure you're on the same page you understand why i don't want you watching these things but otherwise you know the internet has everything and you can freely access it it's, it's like my kids they originally they always would say i don't want any nsfw stuff i don't want to watch anything that's 18 plus rated mm. but they say like since maybe one and a half years Everything seems to be 18 plus rated. Like right. so many people are putting that on their YouTube videos and right. on their content right. that they're saying, I was trying to avoid all that, but now everything has that. Right. And I tried watching it. There was nothing 18 plus in it. Why are people right. mismarking it? Right. And that way they're either leaving me out or making me try those things anyway, because I no longer trust those um, you know, like that safeguarding is basically that ris risk aversion is going so far right. <laughs> that right. it doesn't make sense anymore. Right. But you're saying you were rating games. I interrupted you. Yeah. So, you know, these things always lead to um, fruitful conversations and often hearty debates at the Macumber Center. And we deal with them as a community. Um, the adults here don't make rules you know for the kids to follow um the kids are always involved in the creation of rules and because they see the need for rules like you know you can't um lean back in the chairs because um by the end of the year half of them are going to be broken if you're doing that and I'm glad you don't have my son here <laughs> i mean some of us have the unfortunate habit of leaning back in chairs uh, I, i'm not excluding myself <laughs> But it, it helps to have like a community agreement. We're not going to. And, and so if I'm leaning back in a chair, you can remind me, you know, that's the usefulness of a rule. We don't have, um, you know, unlike a Sudbury school, we don't have a JC or a punishments or something. So if you see a kid leaning back in his chair all the time, you don't bring him up. You just say, um, you know, you really have a habit of leaning back in your chair. You got to stop that. And um, and eventually they do or they um so, yeah, with video games and YouTube videos and what's appropriate and what's not, these, these are community issues, and they're, sometimes they're sort of intractable issues that you just have to com constantly work on because it's always changing. The community is always changing. Sensibilities are always changing, what's acceptable and what's not. Um, the risks and dangers are constantly shifting. A, a kind of policy that made sense two years ago just doesn't make sense anymore. So we have these debates all the time. You know, for example, a long time ago we said, well, how about we just say, because there were these kids were playing video games that were extremely gory and graphic, and they were playing them in the main room where like little kids were seeing it and um, sometimes getting really upset about it, or watching like horror movie-ish kind of YouTube videos and little kids would get scared and run in the bathroom. And, so we had to, you know, have conversations about this. And um, one of the proposals was, well, how about we just like decide that we're not going to play first person shooters? Because there were a couple kids who were playing these games where you could see the gun. And when it was being aimed at somebody and then you blow the head apart, it was just really gory. And, you know, the kids had to point out to the boomers that like, the first person shooter is not a useful category in that way because Minecraft can be a first person shooter game. Uh, 
some of these really innocuous games could be classified as first person. So, you know, we're constantly, the kids are constantly educating us about it. We're, you know, trying to communicate to them sometimes the needs of other community members that they don't recognize. Like, did you know that, you know, Herbie went home and had nightmares all night because of this Five Nights at Freddy thing he saw and his parents are complaining to us. So we need to like you to help us work on this issue. And, you know, the kids love these difficult problems. They love trying to solve these problems more often more than the adults who, who become sort of wary. Um, so what, what are the kids' solutions in this case, for example? What did you decide? A couple of the kids created this really brilliant um, online uh, form where you enter in, you kind of rate the game. As you go, you go through this list of um, different aspects of a video game and you rate it along the way and then it gives you a total score and and then they put up the code on the wall so you scan the code it brings you to the site you rate your own game and see how it comes out and then we have a committee a couple kids who are very savvy with this stuff and the, so the they're the committee for the video game rating system and if if you want to contest it and say like i don't know why i came up with this high score this game's totally innocuous they'll talk about it with you and sort of figure it out. So far, that's working. I mean, if nothing else, it it raises consciousness for everybody about basically what we want is for people to reflect for a second. Is this an appropriate game to be playing in a public space? But you also have various degrees of sensitivity, right? Yeah. Like, some, like my son just hates Halloween decorations, even he would cross the street if he sees it. Right. A house decorated for Halloween, and, and somebody else just loves all that stuff, even though he doesn't enjoy violence or anything, he just likes that aesthetics. Right. So, how do you deal with such differences? Yeah, so, like, you know, language is a, is a good example. We have certain guidelines about language here. Um, there are things that we don't, but they're not rules. It's more like you have to use appropriate language. You can't use inappropriate language. But what is appropriate or inappropriate is different depending on the context. Are you, are, is this two, two 15-year-old boys on the swings down, you know, behind the center where no one else is? Well, it, if they're not exposing each other to, like, traumatic material, they're both kind of familiar with the same stuff, they're not going to upset each other. So whatever they want to talk about is probably fine. Um, but if a couple of kids are sitting on the couch and there's, a, and there's a little kid there or someone who you know, is very sensitive about certain stuff, you have to be aware of that and not talk about stuff that would be inappropriate around that person. So most of the time they figure it out without your help, without adults getting involved. Yes, almost always. We have very, you know, I... I really, this is one thing I really enjoy kind of boasting about, is that we don't really have conflicts here. We don't have bullying. We don't have, like, rule breaking. Because we don't have rules, really. So we don't have rule breaking. We don't punish people. You know, some people think that that's just um, idealistic. You can't do that. It do that wouldn't work. But you come and see it. Somehow it works. I don't know how we... It doesn't work in a coercive environment. Right. But when everybody feels respected, it's like this unfolding... There are so many self-unfolding processes and systems, right. right? Right. Yeah. This is what I experienced as well. And many people, they have uh, been, I believe, misled by like the Lord of the Flies. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is, I think, a very hypocritical and... and basically unrealistic scenario yeah. that a school teacher came up with right. <laughs> right. while the real so do you know that such a story actually happened yeah in, for real and and it uh developed the opposite way that right. the kids just uh naturally came up with rules and ways right. to go about the situation and to yeah. help each other survive yeah yeah it's really interesting But but at the same time, I can imagine that some people coming in here, maybe from the conventional schooling environment, are, well, if not broken in that sense, then damaged and maybe traumatized or have experienced different kinds of, you know, regulations. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're, like, at least I can judge by, like, sometimes if we would have 
guests at home sleeping over that are going to school, mm -hmm. they would, which you're describing, like try to get as much time as possible on the iPad because right. their parents are controlling them at home and right. try to get as much candy from the, <laughs> mm -hmm. from the cupboard as possible because their parents, again, are micromanaging that at home and, and such stuff. And, and I guess it, it can like spread in the, or, or does, do, do they very quickly go back to the more natural ways, which are, I guess, like I said, self-unfolding? Yeah, we sometimes have um, new families who, you know, the parents will say, well, you know, my kid is kind of a handful. He, he doesn't listen very well. He gets, you know, he's had a lot of trouble in school. He, um, all kinds of labels and behavioral stuff. And um, well, well, we're really not equipped to deal with real behavioral problems. Um, we're not. There's nothing therapeutic about this place. Um, I mean, it's kind of naturally therapeutic, but we're not trained or anything. So um, we really can't handle um, behavioral issues that are really outside the norm. But often, when the kid starts coming and discovers that they're really like they can really be themselves here and that nobody's going to be on them all the time about every little thing. They completely relax and they're, they, you know, they can live harmoniously side by side, all kinds of different people. Are they shocked or initially, the, the, the children? The... Um, I don't know, you know, sometimes kids come in kind of wide-eyed, like, oh my God, what is this place? But it's so natural for kids it's also kind of this like, oh yeah, there, I, I knew there must be a place like this somewhere because this is like, you know, it's like a fish in water. Like this is where I'm supposed to be. It makes sense that there's a place in the world which is kind of created for the way kids are. I was wondering whether um, you, your children are still young, right? They're not, or, or are they yeah. attending here? They're, well? They attend full time, yes. They're, and they're nine and 12. And what are they saying? Because I guess they've, their whole lives, they've seen this as your job and where you are yeah like are they do you use their input to make this place even better or they don't give me a lot of input you know that they don't <laughs> it's just home to them you know they don't think about it that much i don't think they probably will when they're older they don't have much to say about it sometimes i ask them what they did even though i'm with them all day like i don't really know what was going on in their minds or how who exactly, you know, who they were talking to or what they were talking about or, you know, my son spends so much time on his computer, I don't really know what he was doing. So I asked... Do you ask him? Yeah, sometimes they say, how was your day? What did you do today? You know, they don't, they don't have much time for that sort of kind of conversation. So I was like writing a blog and putting down what my son was doing like in terms of programming projects and whatever because I felt threatened that if I have to show some kind of proof yeah <laughs> especially because originally the only reason that we were allowed to do stuff differently back in the Netherlands was because he was so gifted you know and like we had to prove it so mm -hmm. I, would, I had the habit of like really keeping track of it and lately he started saying that I feel like that really demotivates me every time you try to register. Mm. So, <laughs> like yesterday, he even actually put like in, in code inside his coding files. There was like this line written in, in HTML, don't ask what this is. And the name <laughs> of the index yeah. file was like secret project. Yeah. So I sometimes feel like, it's like, you know, in quantum mechanics, they say that once you measure it, the wave function collapses. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I sometimes feel like every time I'm trying to maybe keep a record or intervene when they're not actively willing to show me what they're doing, mm. that I'm, I'm somehow already interfering with that very delicate process. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine if somebody followed you around and, and sort of like quantified thing, what you were doing and rated it in terms of productivity and um yeah it's horrible um i mean if i had to describe what i do for my work you know i mostly sit and drink coffee <laughs> and the kids point that out to me all the time draper shouldn't you be do doing something <laughs> but you know i mean this is it's important you know it's important what everybody's doing here is important 
and it's not quantifiable. That would be a horrible, monstrous act of reductionism, and, and nobody wants to have their lives reduced to numbers. And it's terrible. Well, I'm not even talking about quantifying, just, just registering, just, you know, yeah. taking a picture, writing down, mm. he programmed this today. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. And still, that, you know, reduces it, takes the life out of it. So you, you don't do anything like that here? Or with your own kids, you you just wait until they tell you if they want to tell you. Yeah, and they don't. <laughs> <laughs> they don't tell me anything. <laughs> no, you have to be fine with that. Oh, I guess you don't have to. It, no, it I, be... I notice that my kids tell me a whole lot. If I don't ask, then at some yeah. point it breaks. Yeah, sometimes I I envy breaks open. I envy parents like that. You know, sometimes some people have just very talkative kids, and they. They tell me, oh, we were driving home yesterday and my kid was just going on and on about all this amazing stuff he's learning. And I think, wow, really? I wish my child would do that. <laughs> it's just not who they are. That's okay. But is, that, is there a connection between uh, your kids already exposed to so much, so many other kids and that they talk to and like maybe at, at, at some point the stimulation is so much throughout the day? that it's comparable to going to work or going somewhere and they just want to decompress at home? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, when when I get home and my wife asks me, what, what, how was work? Well, it was fine. Well, you know, what did you do? So I, there's, I can't say anything about it. I mean, it's too complicated to explain. It would be tiring to explain. And, and I would never be able to convey the essence of what life on a daily basis is like here. And... You know, the, it's about the subtle dynamics of interactions and kind of like learning things about yourself and about the world that aren't always fully, they're not always fully tangible on an intellectual level. It's more like kind of things coming together. And yeah, I would be hard pressed to really say anything articulate about what I did on a given day, but it's no less meaningful and important. And I respect that it's that that's just how it is for kids too even more so i mean the amount of information they're absorbing on a daily basis on on so many levels is just staggering at my age you know it's kind of dwindled <laughs> but for, for for them it's just like you know there's so much going on and to try to articulate that and a lot of it's not even fully conscious for them but do they ask you questions here and what are the difficult questions that Do they kids ask, ask you? me questions? Yeah, kids ask. The kids here ask the adults questions often. I mean, sometimes it's like nuts and bolts questions. Um, I think one of the really important things about the center and about places like this is that the kids have constant access to adults who they respect and trust and um, sort of look up to, I think, in a natural way. And these adults are not authority figures in their lives. I mean, most kids in our society, the adults they have in their lives are their parents, their parents' friends, the, par the adults that their parents have chosen to be in their lives. They have counselors, pediatricians, dentists, teachers, um, all people telling them what they need to do and what they need to not do. And they don't have any adults in their lives who they can really just trust to be open with and who will be, you know, non-judgmental um, and, you know, someone to listen or someone to give them feedback or somebody to tell them about life. You know, when I was, particularly when I was a teenager, I used to just ask the adults in my life, you know, the staff at Surrey Valley, a lot of whom I was very close with. I just started asking them about adult life. Like, how did you meet your wife? How did you know that it was the right person. How did you get into college? How did you know what you wanted to study in college? Were you scared of taking your driver's test? Would, you know, when you get to that age and you want to know, you, you want to start trying to figure that terrain out. And, um, and you don't want to ask your parents. You don't want to, you know. You, Why not? Why not? <laughs> because they're your parents. <laughs> I don't know. What kid wants to ask their parents for advice about how to become an adult? Even if even, my kids are asking me that. Well, that's great. That's lucky for you and lucky for them. 
Um, Although they also tell me that it feels like I'm their sister. Oh, that's good. That's they great. I think that's the best compliment. They can <laughs> yeah. Not everyone has such a... I mean, you know, I love my parents. I think my kids love me, and I love my kids. But I don't... I don't think we have that kind of relationship, and that's fine. You know, they have other adults in their life. And I was certainly grateful to have other adults in my life. And also they have a, a spectrum of different kinds of adults. You know, the, the adults at the center, there's seven of us. And we cover, I mean, there's a wide spectrum between us in terms of our backgrounds, our experience, our knowledge, our interests, we're all very different. And kids get to know us and sort of know what we're interested in, what our strengths are, what our... So um, they, I think, it's, I think it's a really rich kind of environment for kids to be in for that reason. And it's a, it's a pretty unique thing, um, you know, to have seven adults and to have access to like seven adults who are very different I don't know, who don't have an agenda. And um, to which extent do they also find such people online? Because that's also where you can find people who are adults and, you know, who mm. don't necessarily even have to know your age. <laughs> right. You can, like, interact with them at a different level, especially in certain areas of sharing, shared interests. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's something that kids have now. That, But, you know, there's something about being in a community with people, having to navigate difficult situations, having to solve problems. Mm -hmm. And And do any kids here, or maybe even your kids, ever express that they would prefer not to go anywhere, just stay at home? Like not to come here? Yeah. Um, Like just the sheer, you know, that you have to go somewhere every morning. Maybe they want to sleep late or... I yeah, know. my son is my son is more of an introvert. He would some days he would prefer to just stay home in his room. Uh, my daughter is more like me. She just wants to be around people all the time. Um, so what do you do? Well, with my son, sometimes I say, "You come on, you gotta go." <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna. <laughs> uh-huh. let you go. I'm not. You found. You found. You found where I coerce my kids. Yeah. <laughs> my wife is much more. You have to go to the non-coercive center. Yeah, you have to go to the non-coercive center. My wife is more, much more laid back about it. She'll, I come to work at 9 o'clock or earlier, and my wife brings the kids an hour later or so, and sometimes she shows up and it's just my daughter. And I say, well, where's, where is he? Well, he, wanted to, he, he was comfortable lying in bed. And I said, well, you've got to get him up. He's got to come here. I mean, it's the, the least he has to do. Um, but that's kind of typical father mother stuff too. The father's often feels like, come on, he's going to learn how to live in the world. <laughs> it also depends whether you're a night person or a morning person. Right. right, yeah. Our society is just so biased towards morning people. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> the nice thing about this place is you can come in at any time. Sometimes kids do come in at 11 or 12 in the morning. Which is still early if you ask me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for some people it is. Do most people live in the in the area? Um, some do. Uh, some come from further away. You know, the Boston area. Some kids live right here in Framingham. They don't realize how lucky they are to have it right in their backyard. <laughs> and you mentioned that you sometimes get people from very far away. Like you mentioned that it was a family from China that moved here. We had two families actually from China that moved here to send their kids. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes people really, and occasionally people do. We recently just had a family move up here from, or down here from the North Shore um, so that they could, they bought a house right around the corner so that they could be closer uh, to the center. So I think, you know, it's a pretty unique place. And if you're looking for this kind of thing, we're sort of, um, we're a really good example of self-directed education. So people are willing to move for it. It's really important. Do you feel like now after COVID, you've mentioned that there's much more acceptance of, in general, homeschooling, unschooling, moving further from the conventional school system? What do you think is going to happen in the future? I think in the beginning of COVID, a lot of people in the self-directed education world were very optimistic, you know, that, that it would kind of break the hold that school had on society. I don't know about that. I was skeptical then and I'm skeptical now. I think 
more and more people are leaving school, that's for sure. But I don't think they're really breaking from the paradigm. I think um, a lot of people, a lot more people are doing school from home or not, or, or even homeschooling, let's say. But, you know, I think of homeschooling kind of like working from home. You know, you're still working for the same company. You're still doing the same work. You're just in the comfort of your own home. Um, it would be an entirely different thing if you were to start your own business, leave your job, start something you really love doing. And I think that is what unschooling is all about, or democratic education. And I still think it's very, very rare for, a, a, for parents to let their kids direct their own education. And there's a difference, you know, between a lot of people talk about self-directed education, but what they're really describing, if you ask them what they do on a daily basis with their kids, they're really describing, and this even goes for like learning centers like this, they're really describing child-centered learning. And that's fine, but it's not self-directed learning. I think, um, you know, you can say, well, we really, you know, start from the interest of the child and every child's different and this one's interested in this. And so we're going to create these opportunities for him. And this one's interested in something different. So we'll let them do this. Um, that's sort of following the child's interest as opposed to letting the child set the terms. And I don't, I, I think as many, as much as people are leaving traditional classrooms, I don't think they're really letting children take control of their own education. And is that, in your view, connected to parents restricting online behavior? Because I think if you don't micromanage online behavior, there's almost no way that your child doesn't start self-directing in this way or another. Of course, you can argue that they hardly have any time for that under so much pressure that they're under in schools now and, and all the mental health problems that are arising and, and increasingly following the new generation. Mm -hmm. But still, I think the more freedom they have online, the more that sort of, again, it becomes the self-unfolding mechanism because there's just so much on demand and this is the way we behave on the internet that we just look things up that interest us and, and we can by now find expertise and courses and whatnot. Mm -hmm. even credentialized or not, whatever mm -hmm. you want. Mm -hmm. So in the end, I see like that it will naturally go that way just because to survive, you will need all that on-demand learning because otherwise you won't be able to pick up the skills that you need to survive and, and to move in the fluid world that it has become because you have to really update your skills also. You can't just learn something and, and be done with it. <laughs> right. So I, I see that as a natural process unless you restrict that searching for yourself and the time that you can spend learning and being in the flow of mm -hmm. learning for yourself. Right. So, sorry, what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, ju I'm just asking, do you think uh, you're being skeptical that the paradigm is, is changing very slowly is, is that connected to people also restricting uh, the online oh. self-directed learning? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, parents are really scared of their kids spending too much time online. And I don't think, um, I don't think that's limited to like traditional parent or traditional education world parents. I think um, homeschoolers and even unschoolers um, seem to limit their kids' use of digital technology. Also parents here? Oh, yeah, I think so. Uh, we don't limit the use of technology, but I think some parents say, you know, I'm not sending you there to just play on your iPad all day, you know, and... Um, but at least they are giving the iPad or the like. Yeah, uh, sometimes. Uh, sometimes kids don't come with iPads. Or do they have like screen time controls on there? They their... might. Some kids might, yeah. We, we try to just not get too involved and not be too judgmental with parents who do place limits, you know. You know, I've learned from my experience growing up at Sudbury Valley to be patient with parents and not too judgmental if they're not like fully on board with 
actual self-directed education. I'm certainly not going to get involved in like colluding with parents to make sure their kids don't do too much screen time or to make sure they do their math book or whatever. That I'm not going to do that, but I'm not going to interfere if I suspect that, you know, someone is telling their kid they have to do you know, read a chapter of this book while they're at the center. You know, that's well, between it's a journey, the, right? Yeah. They have to also right, like and be may, at some knows? point on that journey. Who knows? Maybe it's better for their kid, and I don't know their kid as well as they do. So my own personal philosophy is unschooling. And that's the way I was raised, and that's the way I'm raising my kids. And you know, in the old days, unschooling meant you leave your kid alone. <laughs> Now, unschooling seems to mean something different. It means, like, we're, we don't stick to a curriculum, but I frantically cart my kid around to all kinds of enrichment activities based on what I think he might be willing to do, <laughs> right? I'm guilty of that in the past. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most, most parents are, I can tell you. Um, my daughter was like, oh, mom, I think of... Big back of like when COVID started, it was such a blessing. Yeah, because we have we didn't have to go to all those places anymore. Right. But to wrap this up, so what's your forecast? How free are children going to be in self-directed lear learning and their online learning in the let's say the upcoming decade? Oh, my prediction is that things will get worse before they get worse. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Why? good. It's not good. I don't know. It's too, there's only more, pro, parents are under so much more pressure now than they were, you know, 30 years ago, I think. But shouldn't we recognize that kids are also under so much more pressure? Mm -hmm. And shouldn't we finally recognize that that's the main reason that they're that's, so that's damaged what's, that's and what's breaking mental them. health problems? Yeah, that's what's breaking them. Maybe eventually it'll get so bad that people will start writing mainstream articles about it. Um, you know, parents... A lot of parents do read and believe what um, authors, you know, what prof the professionals say. And when the professionals start saying, you know, it's too much, these kids need a break, maybe people will start listening. But the mainstream media, all you read is, you know, when you read about the decline of mental health among teens, people blame iPads and iPhones, even though there's no evidence. In fact, the opposite. So when, if when you're barking up the wrong tree, you're never going <laughs> to fix the problem. My, my general view is, is that like, if we just leave the conventional system alone, it will go extinct eventually, and we just do our thing. Yeah. And as long as it's legal, I'm very happy it's legal in this country. Yeah, we should count our blessings. At least it's legal. Even if it doesn't you know, it become like a you know, full-blown movement, at least it's legal. We can be thankful for that. Hopefully it will continue to be legal. That's, the, that's our modest wish. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's my <laughs> pleasure. This was a conversation with the head of the May Comber Center in Framingham, Massachusetts, Ben Draper. Please check out the links to the center and the resources we mentioned during the episode in the show notes. To support this podcast, to join my Discord server, and if you want to help me brainstorm for my upcoming book, Free to Browse, please visit my website, unschoolingfuture.net. And I've also started a YouTube channel at Unschooling Future, where I'm uploading this season's episodes with captions, as well as my recent animated short films. So please support me and subscribe and spread the word. Until next time. Unschoolingfuture.net